This video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. More later in the video. Hey guys, Quiff the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be talking a bit more about my big setup, in particular the off-axis guider that I installed on it in a previous video, which by the way has been working absolutely great. Uh, now off-axis off guiding is a way of keeping the stars when you're imaging perfectly still and stable as you're tracking them as they move across the sky from our perspective because the Earth rotates. And I explained all of that in my previous video, so I'll put the link uh, up above for you to have a look. But basically, we have the main camera here, the big one here. The small camera is the guiding camera, and there's a little prism there inside the uh, assembly that will reflect some of the light that would go to the uh, main camera normally, and it will put it towards this guide camera. The guide camera will look at the stars that it sees and very quickly, very often, it analyzes those stars and sees whether we are deviating from the stars or not. If we see that we are deviating from the, the stars, we're telling the mount that carries the telescope uh, here to adjust course so that we can keep the stars perfectly still while we're doing long exposures. It's awesome for astrophotography and the off-axis guider uh, compared to other techniques like a, a separate guide scope uh, allows you to use the main optics to do guiding and also it will get rid of a lot of issues such as a uh, flexure um, which can lead to having good guiding numbers but bad tracking of stars. This is something that the off-axis guider avoids. That said, in my previous video, when I showed how to set up that off-axis guider, or OAG, I had forgotten to talk about some issues that you may face with such a setup. And one of those issues was the star shapes. Because if you look inside an off-axis guider assembly, you have the sensor at the center of the image, and the prism that will capture the light is towards the outside of the image. And your telescope creates what we call an imaging circle, basically a circle where it will actually project the stars that it sees. And depending on the telescope, that, sm that circle can be smaller or larger. And because your prism, this little mirror at the top that catches the light to get stars into the guide camera, um, is outside of the center of the field of view so that it is not overlapping with the sensor, we don't want to put a shadow on the sensor, obviously, then it will catch stars that are at the edge of the field of view. And very often, those, scar those stars, depending on the optics, can be very, very, very weirdly shaped. Those stars, typically, when you'll see them, they're like shaped like comets or like almost like lines. And the better corrected your optics are, the better those shapes uh, will be. If you're trying to use an off-axis guider on a Newtonian telescope like this one without a coma corrector, this is setting yourself up for failure. That said, the main software that is used for guiding, for auto-guiding, uh, which is uh, PHD2, is very good at dealing with poor star shapes and it will recognize most often those comets as stars or com comet shapes uh, points of light as stars and be able to guide without any issues on those and this is actually related to a second uh, problem or issue that has been mentioned with the off-axis guiding uh, solution which is what about refocusing so if i'm changing things like my filter during the night, whether it's done via a filter drawer like this manually or via an automated filter wheel, very often that leads to a refocusing of the system. So we're gonna change very slightly the distance between the main camera and the main telescope optics. What this means is that we are also changing the focus point for the off-axis guider. So the guide camera becomes slightly out of focus or even sometimes pretty much out of focus. And so what do we do about refocusing it? There's no way we can automatically refocus the guide camera. And my answer to that is we completely, 100% ignore it. So I'm gonna show you an example on the screen where I was guiding just yesterday with completely out of uh, focus star images. I did it on purpose. I actually moved the guide camera so it would be out of focus. You're welcome, I sacrificed myself for you guys. And the guiding worked perfectly without issue. <laughs> 
And this is because the software that is used uh, to guide recognizes those stars even when they're misshapen, even when they're out of focus. This is really because stars, when they're in focus, they basically follow, if you, if you graph their, the, the brightness of the star compared to like a distance on the line that cuts through the stars, you'll see that the star brightness, basically when it's perfectly in focus, should follow a normal curve or a normal distribution. And when you get it out of focus, that normal curve will get wider. And if you have a central obstruction in your system, like in a Newtonian or a schmidt cassegrain telescope, you'll even start seeing two peaks of light on that, uh, on that curve because we are basically getting a donut shape. But uh, PHD2 does not care. PHD2 detects like blobs of light without really caring whether they're in focus or not, and then computes the center of that blob. And then it's only the center of that blob, basically a center of luminance or center of gravity of that blob that it computes. And if that center of gravity, center of luminance of that blob moves, then it will tell the mount to adjust its course to keep track of the stars. PhD2 and guiding software in general is extremely good at uh, keeping track of stars, even when they're misshapen, even when they're out of focus. If you're watching this video and you're getting, getting tingles, thinking about normal deviations and star shapes and all of that kind of stuff, and you want to refresh your knowledge on those or just learn new things related to math and computer science and physics and all of that good stuff, I highly recommend checking out brilliant.org, which I think is the best way to learn about math, science, statistics and computer science. I use Brilliant almost every single day. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I'm learning new things at the same time. And there are tons of lessons uh, available from very basic ones if you just want to refresh your memory on basic concepts to very advanced ones as well. So it can really fit your level very easily. All of the lessons, they're bite-sized. They're very in interesting and very easy to understand. And they're also super interactive. So you immediately see and get an intuition for what the concepts are. Plus they add new uh, courses and new topics to learn about like every single month. So you never get bored. Uh, in preparing for this video, just for the fun, I was going back through some lessons of statistics on brilliant.org and that was a lot of fun. Because the lessons are so fast to go through, it actually is easy for me to fit them in my busy daily schedule of uh, working full time and also making YouTube videos. So if you also want to have fun like me learning or refreshing your knowledge on math and science, and you want to experience all that Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, you should go to brilliant.org slash quivlazygeek or simply click the link in the description. And the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Now going back to the star shapes and uh, regardless of normal distributions, if you do get poor star shapes uh, that are due to your optics and imaging circle, one of the ways you can deal with this is take this little prism there and you can adjust the stalk to push this prism deeper towards the sensor. And the smaller your sensor, the more space you have to push the prism in as close to the sensor as you can without getting diffraction artifacts or shadows on the sensor. Uh, this can be quite sensitive, but this is one way to deal with uh, such poor star shapes. The larger the sensor you have, the less wiggle room you have for those adjustments. So if you're using a smaller sensor, uh, like I have here actually with this uh, IMX585 uh, sensor, then you really have room to play with that distance. There's also a common issue with off-axis guiders, and that happens more often during the galaxy season uh, than right now in, uh, in summer or late summer and early autumn, it is uh, the lack of stars because you're using such a small prism in there. Together with typically a small sensor for a guide camera, very often, not very often actually, but from time to time, it might be difficult for your guide camera to find a star on that prism. And it's not so much an issue when you have a fairly uh, short focal length on your main optics. This one has a focal length of around 517 millimeters. So it's still fairly short focal length. And that means that even on my small prism and small uh, guide camera sensor, I will pretty much always have stars available. If you're using an off-axis guider on a larger telescope, let's say a telescope with a focal length of 1,400 millimeters, uh, then 
that could truly become an issue. And there are many ways that you can deal with this. One of the ways would be to simply rotate the whole assembly on itself until the off-axis guider has found a guide star. Obviously, you're also changing the rotation of your field of view. You can also independently rotate the off-axis guider to try to find a guide star but at the same time, we want to make sure that it still doesn't overlap with the sensor in the middle, because if you're in the diagonal of the sensor or on the long axis of the sensor and your prism is going towards the, cent the center a bit too much, then it might overlap, so that becomes an issue as well. Also, that operation of rotating the off-axis guider is easier on some of off-axis guiders than it is on others. It's really a pain on this one, the ZW off-axis guider, which is a, a decent one. Its first version was horrible, but the current one is, is pretty decent, but it's not the best out there. If you're using a high focal length telescope, like if you're using a, a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, I actually highly, highly recommend the Celestron off-axis guider. That thing is a beast. It's built like a tank. It has a huge prism. And if you pair it with a large sensor guide camera, like uh, the 174mm camera, then you will pretty much always have stars available in that field of view, even without having to rotate the off-axis guider. But even if you do have to rotate the off-axis guider, the Celestron OAG makes it easy. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful OAG, but uses a lot of back focus. So it's not suitable for uh, setups like this one, where I have only 55 millimeters of back focus. And another issue that often comes up with off-axis guiders is what happens to my guiding while I'm auto-focusing or while I'm changing the filter. If you're using an automated filter wheel and if you're auto-focusing throughout the night, which is very common with amateur photographers, especially if you have a monochrome camera, then while you're auto-focusing, while you're changing the filter, there's some weird stuff going on on the ca guide camera. If you're changing the filter, the guide camera might not get stars for one exposure and then start getting stars afterwards. Um, if you're changing the focus, the focus on the stars of the guide camera will start switching as well, which could confuse the guiding algorithm. The good news is even without doing anything, it will only be a transient kind of issue. It will recover itself as soon as the autofocus is done or as soon as the filter change is done. You're just going to get some weird stuff happening on your guiding in the meantime. Uh, so what I would suggest, and this is available in most astrophotography capture software like Nina, is you can actually tell Nina to stop guiding while you're autofocusing and to stop guiding while you're changing a filter. Obviously, that means that you stop the guiding and you'll have to restart the guiding. It's done automatically, but it still means there's a little bit of overhead and lost imaging time because of that. But that is definitely a solution for that particular issue. By the way, all of those videos are made possible by my amazing Patreon supporters and channel members. So thank you so much for your support. And it's also made possible thanks to you all viewing these videos. And of course, going down below, subscribing to the channel, clicking that bell icon and leaving a comment. It truly helps make the channel stand out. So thank you so much for all of your support. But with that, that's really all I wanted to mention about like the potential issues that you could have with off-axis guiders, as well as the solutions on how to hopefully fix them. I hope this was useful. And with that, as always, thank you so much for watching. Don't don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.